Hey there, welcome to another episode of your Faith and Health Community. I'm your host, Pastor Jackie Jackson. And as always, on behalf of myself and our producer, Anita Alexander, we want to thank you very much for taking time out of your day to spend with us. Hopefully, no, definitely, we'll give you some information that will improve your quality. So what I'm going to do that you may not be used to is jumping right into the show. We have from the Cincinnati Health Department three individuals here that are going to give you some information. You know, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge or lack of information. Today, as always, there will be no need for you to perish. So get a pen, get a piece of paper in case you need to write something down, in case you need it so that you don't forget it, all right? Let's get started. I mentioned we have here with us three members or three, yeah, members or employees from the Cincinnati Department, uh, Cincinnati, City of Cincinnati Health Department. And we have with us first Dr. Camille Jones, who is the Assistant Health Commissioner. Yeah, we got some heavy hitters here today. We have the Assistant Health Commissioner. It's also the Division Director of Community Health and Environmental Health Services. To my right, and I've worked with this young lady before, back when I was in Ro with Enroll America, so it's awesome having her here. Yeah. Angela Robinson, who is the Outreach and Enrollment Manager. And over to the far left, we have Mr. John Sanders, who is the, and I'm going to try to get this right, the sanitarian supervisor. And shortly, he's going to explain to you what the sanitarian supervisor is, because when he told me, I thought he was like an extension of some bishops or something like that, you know, <laughs> a hierarchy up in the church. But it's not that. You're going to get that information. So we're going to jump in here. Um, a question that you may have or you may not, you may already know the answer to. I'm just going to be honest. I know of the health department. I've been to the health department. I've seen the health department. But in all actuality, I don't totally or maybe have a real good understanding of what exactly the health department does. And so I'm going to turn to Dr. Jones first to start this out. Why don't you explain to us what is the health department? The health department is an agency that's really dedicated to improving the health of the citizens of Cincinnati. Um, we work mostly in the background. A lot of the activities that we have people don't see because we're trying to prevent illness and improve health. Um, but we are a basic public safety entity. We've been around for 192 years. Um, we started in 1820, um, and we've been offering clinical services for, um, since the 1930s. Um, most times when people think of the health department, they think of the clinical services that we offer. But we as a health department are a gym because we have both the basic, basic public health services and the clinical services that we're offering. And Examples of basic uh, public health services, things like environmental health, uh, decreasing environmental hazards. Um, Mr. Sanders, who's, who's going to be talking soon, will be talking about food safety. Um, we also do things for healthy homes to try to make sure that the uh, hazards in the homes are abated. Um, we look at things like uh, swimming pools and uh, uh, when you have mosquitoes, we're doing testing for the mosquitoes to make sure there's not West Nile virus in the mosquitoes. And if we do detect it, then we're giving people information about how to decrease the risk of being bitten. So the, the, and that's just talking about things, some of the things in my division. The health department has 400 employees. We have seven major divisions. And we do a lot in the city to try to improve the health of the citizens. OK, so let's do this. Let's jump over, since, since you mentioned um, Mr. Stan, I'm going to call you John. Is that okay? I'm That's fine. John. Um, <laughs> since you mentioned him, when I think of the health department, and, and probably a lot of people, the main function I always thought about was they go out and they check houses or they check apartments if to be sure everything's okay, and then they go to the restaurant. And to be honest with you, for a long time, that's what I thought the whole function mm -hmm. of the health department is. There's so much more, but that part of restaurant safety, we all at one point or another are eating out someplace. That's right. And so, and we were talking earlier, you know, about some of the questions or some of the issues that I've seen or what I, I assume are issues. So what exactly do you do, or, or, or the sanitarian, what exactly is that position? Oh, okay. Well, um, what it is is the sanitarian, which is also known as a health inspector, and we typically go out to restaurants or any type of facilities and do inspections. Now, I am the supervisor of the food safety program, which means we do all of the inspections for any type of restaurants, 
or any type of grocery stores. Grocery stores. As well, yes, exactly. So when we go through our sanitarians, we'll go through and do the inspection, check lists from what items one through 66, a big long list that we check for, and we just, they're either in compliance or they're out of compliance. We check food temperatures, food safety, we watch for employee safety, which means they better be washing your hands because the number one way to contract the foodborne illness now is through improper hand washing. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that all food safety, all food employees are washing their hands and using like gloves and things like that, hair nets, hair restraints, and making sure the food is safe. And um, our main goal is to protect every man, woman, and child that eats in a restaurant in Cincinnati, Ohio. And that, that's a good goal. Now let me ask a question. Um, Washing your hands. I've been in restaurants, and I won't say the name, although I want to. I've seen people go from the mop to the register. And there's been times where I've even had to say, you are going to wash your hands right. And then they turn around as if to go, oh, yeah, that's probably something I should do. And you said hairnets. I can't remember the last time I've been in a restaurant where there's a hairnet. And then I got one last thing I want to add to that. Yeah. It turns up grocery stores. And I guess it does make sense, but I have to be honest, from my standpoint, I never thought about the health department and the grocery store unless there's, you know, like Kroger has the kitchen, they have a deli or something along those lines. Right, but right. but that's, it's, do you have something to deal with other than in, say, the deli department? or something like that? Are you coming out down the aisles as well? Yeah. Um, really? By, by all means, the deli is only a small portion of our inspection when it comes to a big Kroger's mm -hmm. or IGA or whatever. Um, we look at all parts of the grocery store. Uh, first of all, we always go back in the back area where the food comes in to make sure it's being um, delivered properly and coming in safely. Um, we do break down the grocery store into different areas. Like Let's say, for instance, we have the deli area but you also have the frozen food department. You also have seafood. You have all kinds of different, you have bakery. So each one of our inspectors go through each and every department and, and score it and inspect it properly. Um, we also go up and down our aisles when we do a grocery canned store. Goods. Yep, canned goods. And the most important thing we do is actually, we, we look at baby formula and we have to, we always, pay close attention to the, um, the date, the expiration date, because that's very important. If you're selling expired baby formula and giving it to the public, you can make a baby sick. So those are some of the things we do. We, we look through a rotisserie area. If you have rotisserie chicken, uh, we do it all. Um, it takes us a while. It, it, you said 67, is it 67, 61 checklist? Oh, uh, 66 item. items 66. on our checklist. And that's newly formulated from the state. Okay. Yep. And can you talk about some of the wow. instruments that you use? Oh, I sure will. Uh, uh, when we, when a, one of our inspectors go into a um, restaurant or grocery store, the instruments we will have, obviously, we show our badge. Um, we have a flashlight so we can see any in behind equipment. Uh, we also have a thermometer. That's probably our most important item. Um, a probe thermometer, probe in the food to make sure the food is at a proper temperature. Um, um, as far as anything else we would need, uh, that's about it, flashlight, phone, thermometer, sometimes test strips um, to test sanitary, sanitation level and um, clean and dirty water, and um, pH strips. Um, and that is to test sushi to make sure that, you know, that's properly being handled. Mm. See, I think the best way to test sushi is cook it. I mean, that's just my, I mean, that's just my opinion. So, so this isn't a put on your Stacey Adams and, 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 and job, right? Because you're saying you're going behind equipment. So it's, it's really to make sure that every aspect of a grocery store um, is, is clean. Because I would assume if, if there's, I don't know, if bacteria is in the front, eventually it's going to make its way around? Would, would that be a safe thought? Yeah, that's one thing we do look for. Um, mold, definitely, mold is more visible than bacteria, obviously. But as far as the bacteria, we just look at the age of the food, how long it's been out, 
we ask those questions because food can only be held for up to seven days in a, in a refrigeration unit, and it has to be date labeled. So we check for things like that. If it's been there longer than seven days, then bacteria can start to develop. So then let me ask you, so, so let's say you're in a grocery store or you're in a restaurant and you see something that concerns you, mm -hmm. right? You're looking at a process. Um, anybody can forget something once, right? But if you notice, if it's a place you frequent or you're in there and you notice that hands aren't being washed, you notice that, um, that, that I don't know, gloves aren't being worn or the person is going from the cash register back getting your chicken nuggets, what, what, what do you do? I mean, do you make a phone call? Do you, call, do you tell the manager? What, what recourse or what should the average Joe in the grocery store do? That's a, that's a very good question because a lot of times they're not going to do those things in front of us. They'll do it in front of the customer. Mm -hmm. So basically we'll, all we ask is just contact the Cincinnati Health Department or whatever health department um, area you happen to be in where, where you see the, um, the violation going on. Just simply call us, let us know when it happened, what you saw, and then we'll go unannounced and do an inspection to see if we see those same uh, activities going on. Okay, so there you go. If, you, if you're in a restaurant, if you're at Kroger, uh, he said IGA, you could tell he's over 20 um, because he said IGA. <laughs> I, <sure did. laughs> I am over 20. <laughs> but if you're at a grocery store, you're in a restaurant, and you're seeing something that's not making sense or you're concerned about, reach out to the health department. And, and um, Anita, our producer, she will have that information up on who you need to reach out to, probably John or whatever. But it's up to us to make sure that we're just as safe as it is the, the health department's job to make sure that we're safe. So if we're not paying attention and we're not looking, because like John said, they're not going to do it in front of them. And if they do, then you got to wonder not just about their health, but their mental health. So, um, <laughs> so let's move on. But thank you very much, John. Um, Dr. Jones, let me see. You are the, it's the director over the environmental? Um, it's the uh, envir Community Health and Environmental, environmental Health Services Division. So I think, tell us, let's talk, what is community health and what is the environmental health? Um, the community health part is our health promotions and worksite wellness, um, our uh, epidemiology and evaluation. Um, we have a vital records, you know, we run the vital records office for the city. Uh, which includes not only registering births and deaths, but also providing statistics about births and deaths, you know, to help with surveillance. Um, you know, so, so there's a lot that's going on. We have, in, in addition to the food safety, the healthy homes that I mentioned, solid waste in terms of monitoring landfills, um, uh, taking, looking at how uh, uh, tires are held to make sure that they don't pose a health hazard, and the health hazard would be collection of water and breeding of mosquitoes. Um, tattoo parlor licensing, household sewage um, inspections, uh, rabies uh, investigations, um, you know, swimming yeah, swimming pools. You know, if people are going into the swimming pools in the summer, you have to make sure that the level of, of chlorine in the swimming pools is at a certain level so that you don't have the risk of transmitting disease from one child who gets in the water when they shouldn't have with diarrhea to other people. Um, so that's just that's just that part of. What do you have a staff about twenty thousand? <laughs> well, we need more. We need more. <laughs> we need more. I mean, because you just ran down a whole list, and probably things. You know, the most I think I think about tires mm -hmm. are that three dollars I have to pay <laughs> to have my tires disposed of when I go right. get new tires. Right. I think that's the most. I never think about a tire as an environmental yes, it is. hazard. Yes, it is. So uh, j just. Along that line, are there some more things that maybe someone like me wouldn't even think as an issue? I know you just ran down a long list. Yes. I didn't mention um, childhood lead poisoning. And that's, that's a very, uh, very significant risk because- Still now. Oh, yes. In People think age. it's over. But, it, but it's actually getting more and more, uh, uh, we, you know, the level that's considered uh, lead poisoning has, has been decreasing over time because people have found that kids still have problems, you know, learning problems, behavior problems, and it's now said that there's no safe level of lead. Um, but we have some neighborhoods where we have, you know, up to 10% of the kids lead poisoned. Wow. Lead poisoned. Lead poisoned. So let me poisoned. ask you this then, because when I, when I think back when I was younger, about 15 years ago when mm -hmm. I was a kid, and I think <laughs> back to that time, 
always associated lead poisoning with kids eating chip paint. I have no idea, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll be honest, I'm, I don't know mm -hmm. any other idea of how a child would get lead poisoning, because that's all I knew, it was eating right. chips of paint. Some of it is not even eating chips of paint. Sometimes the paint itself will turn into a dust, and, and the kids, you know, especially young kids, you know, between the ages of one to two, they start crawling and you know, put stuff in their mouth and all like that. But kids, and so that's the major cause of lead poisoning. But you know, kids can get it from from different types of uh, things like toys, you know, especially some toys that are made overseas. Pencils. Um, well, yeah, if they're looking okay, at the lead on the wondering. pencils, you know, um, we're we have a major thing going on with the Greater Cincinnati Waterworks where they're trying to assist people in getting rid of uh, lead service pipes, and so you know, there still are some households in the city that have uh, pipes that are, are lined with lead going into their homes. And there's actually a program that the uh, Greater Cincinnati Waterworks or uh, GCWW has to help. It's a loan program, but to help people if uh, if they're replacing the lines, the water main lines, to help the homeowner up replace the lead service lines going into their home. So uh, if if if. And so I'm assuming that means that getting the water coming through the, the through the tap and whatnot. Water coming so through the tap. So if it's so hazardous, and I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that you're not going to be able to answer, I know, because, but why is it still allowed to be used? Why is the water still allowed? Well, not the water, but why, the if, pipes. if the pipes oh, yeah. are the contamination, if the pipes are causing the contamination. We're trying to get rid of, we're, we're trying, over, it's going to be over a 15 year span, but the goal of that program is to get rid of all the lit service lines. That so eventually to, it's not yes, going to be. That is Just real quick, let me ask you if you even have these statistics. Say 30 years ago mm -hmm. with children with lead poisoning versus now, mm -hmm. has it been a major increase, would you say? Has it been a decrease or it's floating there, around the same? There's been a decrease in the number of children who have lead levels that are greater than 10. But now we know there's no safe level of lead. The level of concern that they have right now is five micrograms per deciliter. They're considering lowering it to three, but really we don't want children to have lead in their blood. Um, this, is, this is a recent thing that's happened over the last you know, a couple hundred years. People don't normally have lead in their blood, it's, and it's an environmental toxin. It's one of the most common causes, reversible causes of poisoning of, uh, you know, reversible uh, lifelong disability in kids is exposure to lead. So and it's preventable. So then, what? God, I have like a, a million questions, and we're going to run out of time if I keep asking them. But what? What are the effects? I know if my if my child has the flu, I, I can see it. I can feel the temperature, the runny nose. Mm -hmm. If they broke their arm, it's looking funny. I can. But if my child has these levels, well, any day, any level mm -hmm. is bad. But where, where it's actually affecting them, how do I know? How do I even know there's an it. issue? You have to check it. And, and this is something that's really important also is because we know, we know that um, only about 35% of kids are getting checked for lead in the city. And Cincinnati is a city where most homes have lead and paint in it. So there's a lot of there's lead. A, there's a lot of lead. And also, even when you demolish a home, um, when you do rehab for a home, you have to do it lead safe. But when you demolish a home, you just take the home down and then you have uh, sort of dust the spreading. spreading around. Um, and so we know that there's a lot of lead in, in dust around the city. Um, most of the children who are lead poisoned are not going to be showing symptoms, but it's still affecting their, their uh, neurologic so there's no development. Visual. There's no visual for, for the levels of lead that we're talking about, but it still is going to affect them in the future. And, and, and what all does it affect? It affects their neurologic development. It affects their uh, impulsivity. Um, you know, uh, sometimes people who have lead have had lead poisoning have symptoms like the um, ADHD, um, you know, hyperactivity sort of symptoms. Um, in terms of learning, in terms of just developmental, they have some developmental delays, um, and it's preventable. So there are some things that we. There are some signs. They're just not signs that we're going to see right away. So over a period of time, and then that, that seems like But what like you want to do, you want to catch it. You want to catch it because even if the, the, the damage is irreversible, the damage is also cumulative. And so if you catch it early. Is there a, is there a lead home testing kit? 
No, you have to, you, you, you can, but any, any parent, and this is very important, any parent can bring a child to one of the Cincinnati Health, uh, uh, health Department health centers and request a lead test. And we have a sliding scale system for, for payment, and so, you know, income is not, it should not be a barrier to requesting this lead test. Only 35% of kids are being tested. And then we know in some neighborhoods, 10% of kids, of the kids who are tested, are lead poisoned. But for the 65% of kids who aren't tested, there's a lot of them who are lead poisoned right. too. So you yeah. only have a 10% based on who's coming in. Who's coming in. Which means that, like you said, we have a lot of, of, a of, lot of, of children who, who may be getting, maybe I'm taking this too far, but getting bad grades. Yes. And, yep. and it's not that they're not trying. Right. They it's have that lead there's poison and don't even realize it. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Wow. Right. And, and, it's, and it's sort of sapping the strength of, of the kids of our city. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because you know, we've got brilliant kids, but, you know, but if, you, if you, you know, give those uh, the neurologic insults, then you, know, you may be smart, but you're not as smart as you would have been. Mm. You know? yeah. So again, like I said, there, I, hope you're, I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm getting educated right now, and that's a good thing. I hope you're getting educated, and some of the symptoms, some of the things that Dr. Jones has mentioned, even if you're seeing something like that or you're concerned, get to a health center, get your child checked. Maybe check yourself, too. And, and check that child age one and age two, but if the child's older than age two, if they've never been checked, get them checked whatever age, whatever age. Even my age, 21. Yes. I should get <laughs> well, checked, too. Well, the, the other thing is that a lot of times people are doing rehab, and many people don't know that there's a safe way to do rehab in your house. You know, so people are scraping that lead paint, and they're not doing it in a lead safe way, and they themselves could get lead. I've poisoned. done that before. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All right. You know, I want to. I want to move. Were well, you getting ready to say something? No. I want to <laughs> move over because um, I want to make sure we don't run out of time, and this this is also equally important. Open enrollment has started. It started November first. So all of the life changing, you don't have to worry about that now. If your compliance is it two months over, and um, Angela Robinson is an enrollment specialist. She, well, she knows the whole thing. That's why she manages everybody, <laughs> and, she, and she's very good at what she does. So why don't you talk about open enrollment? It's here. Yes, ah, it, finally. We survived. we survived. So we are now into open enrollment six. Six. If you can believe it. We started wow. this in October 1st of 2013 was the first year and we are now at the sixth open enrollment. Um, unfortunately though, however, there are only 45 total days for people to enroll. It started November the 1st. It ends on December the 15th. And that time includes weekends. So people have a shorter period of time to enroll. The advertisement is not there. So people don't really right. realize that it's open enrollment. So it's really great that you have this opportunity for the listeners to know now is the time to call, to get some assistance, to get that health care that you've been without for the last year or six months. Um, or longer. Or even longer. Mm -hmm. It's just it's never too late to get health care. And so it's really great. We have local people here that can help you. And that's what, you know, Pastor Jackson, as you know, I've always been passionate, just like you have been, about having that local connection of having somebody to talk to, right. to sit down with that can help you navigate that whole process. It's great to have healthcare.gov, it's wonderful, but the people that we assist, and we have some of the toughest clients that come back year after year after year, and that's great. It I is, mean, we're there to the help thing. them, um, but now is the time to do that. I think December the 15th is on a Friday, so the time is just ticking by, and um, we've been really busy with people calling, but and now is the time. Places, right? And I there are less cases, right? Because when we started, you could get enrolled at the bus stop eating a sandwich. Exactly. And you could go anywhere to get, open and to get help with your enrollment, but now it's pretty limited. The funds um, that the health, that the federal government now, you know, makes available is limited really to mainly the health centers, um, and there are a few navigators that are out there. We still have a navigator that's in the Dayton area. Oh, really? oh okay. But um, what, what are they I, called? That's, um, I can't remember. Because Marjorie worked Right, there, absolutely. I, I don't remember. Absolutely. But all of the local health centers still have certified application counselors that are available. 
to assist people with open enrollment. Um, so is that e so literally each health center? So each each federally qualified health center should have at least one person that should be available to help them. And even if you don't live in the city of Cincinnati and you need help, you can call and I know Anita will have our number and I'd be willing to help get you to the, a place that's closer to you even from Kentucky. for assistance. Kentucky, I have a connection in Kentucky okay. also that right. I've been working with for the last six years okay. that she refers people to me, I refer people to her um, because we just wanna get people connected. We don't want any barriers in the way of people not knowing where to go. Um, I don't typically give you the answer, I don't know. I may say I don't know now, but let me call you back and right. I can give you an answer. So yeah, that's it's really important, I think, that people know open enrollment is now and it ends on December the 15th. So please call. So it's please not call. even 45 days. What, what, what is it's day a total of, of it's, it ends on the 15th. It started November the 1st and it ends on December the 15th. And so it's a total of 45 days, but we're down to, you know, around 30 at this point and even fewer. So we want to make sure that people know that now is the time to call in order to get help. And listen, don't wait. You know, <laughs> yes, I remember so the days. The, well, see, um, during the time when we first started, you could wait, yeah, or people did forever, wait. Yeah. We had people who were in line, and in line meant you had made a contact to one of us or you called healthcare.gov and asked for assistance. Now, if you do not enroll by midnight, I say actually it's 11.59 on December the 15th, you have to wait an entire year unless you have a special enrollment period. Without insurance. Without insurance. And you do not want to be without insurance for a whole year. Anything can happen. Anything. And we've seen cases throughout the last five years of people who begrudgingly enrolled into health care only to call us three months later to say I'm so glad that you helped navigate help me navigate that I had a major catastrophe happen and I needed that health care um, and we just you know we not only help people enroll into coverage we assist people in understanding the language and how to navigate the health care system in order to use the coverage that they have well, let me ask you what about and I, I know when when I was in enrolled, we had started education, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people did not know how to use. Correct. You, you obtained the health care. Right. Then you weren't sure how to use the health care. Right. right. So is there still assistance to help people yes. understand? Yes. yes, yes. We still do, and all of the health centers still help people understand, well, how do I use this new health care? What is, what's a copay? What's coinsurance? Um, you know, what's a deductible? Those are common terms that even sometimes, you know, general lay people, we just don't understand those terms, but we help people understand that. And we help them with the marketplace. It's really important because a lot of times people are just looking at that premium. They're looking at that premium and that's all they're looking at. They don't realize that you may pay a slightly higher premium, but you may have a lower copay, you may have a lower deductible, lower coinsurance. So we help them and the deductible navigate. Really, a lot of times it's the deductible that's going to really Correct. hit you right. the hardest. It is. You know? It so, is. You know, that, that becomes important. And I, and I see Anita giving me the signal. Um, yes. On what what is the what is the guideline? I, I I've been doing it up until open enrollment, but mm -hmm. what is what is the actual guideline? Let's say I'm single and um, I make sixteen thousand two hundred and twenty eight. Am I good? Am I still Medicaid? Am I marketplace? If you what are if you are between the ages of nineteen and sixty four and you make the amount of money that you just said you're still eligible for Medicaid. I was right. Yes, yes. So you can you can actually enroll into Medicaid um, throughout the whole year. Right, but yeah. what we don't pe want people to do is to wait until after open enrollment is over to go and apply because you may be over income. Right. And if you're over income for Medicaid, again, you have to wait until the year is over until the next open enrollment in 2019. So we always encourage people to come in if you don't have health care. You know, bring in your information so we can help see if you're eligible, not just for Medicaid, but how to help get you into the marketplace. In the um, and, you know, we help people throughout the year who are who come in in June and have never had health care, but they're over income for Medicaid. And so now is the time of the year that we are encouraging people to to come back.
And I want to thank you all for coming out. And, but listen, I want to thank you very much again for taking time out on behalf of myself and our producer, Anita Alexander. We really thank you for your time. And I